I feel like internet music is, it's really something that I'm always figuring out because it's continuously changing. The sounds are always being shifted around. Every era has that. You know, I, I feel like hyper pop um, or what we call now as hyper pop is a, a certain iteration of, of that internet music movement. Everybody wants to know, how is this? And this. Considered to be in the same musical universe, let alone the same genre. Let's get into it. Last summer, I released a video on Charlie XCX and the exploding popularity of Hyperpop. The video frustrated a lot of Hyperpop fans and I totally get why. The video's title was a hot take that lasered in on one artist in only one section of the ever-growing hyperpop universe. To be clear, I still stand by my central argument that Charlie ultimately became the face of a network of hyperpop artists. A community of philosophically similar but aesthetically diverse musicians of which he both influences and is influenced by and I still believe that she used her stature and supreme pop sensibilities to yes, popularize, but also canonize the experimental electronic aesthetics she was adopting into a largely perceivable entity. However, I firmly recognize that this is only one piece to the puzzle, and it's imperative that this narrative is expanded. There were many figures who had gotten hyperpop, aka bubblegum bass, aka PC music, aka internet music, aka whatever, to that point in the first place. And they must be heard. The people that were doing stuff before the hyperpop playlist was going on are so important and without them in the communities they built, there would not be all these other artists that were influenced by them. Of course, AG Cook, the PC Music Clan, and Sophie were instrumental to the development of what we now think of as hyperpop. Sophie's music in particular, with its startling combination of emotional pop catharsis and experimental, groundbreaking electronic dance music techniques and sound design, set the major blueprint for everything that followed. Yeah, 2012-2013 is when I became like aware of of things and I still see those types of uh, motifs in hyper pop music today and you know Sophie was such a big was such a big influence because she she really like she really changed up the whole shit she changed up the whole shit the person who invented hyper pop is Sophie and A.G. Cook concurrently probably other people that have invented what it is now because all of that metallic soundscape stuff and sound design stuff that is really prevalent in 100 decks of music is inspired i would say directly from the things that sophie was doing yeah. like i think sophie was probably the producer that really like encapsulate making sound design like a very visceral thing in a pop context she was this golden shining star of like you can do that you can do this thing you can have this weird niche of like wanting to do crazy sound design pop music and be a trans woman and be so sick and badass like, you can't be the butt of a of the joke when you're so you know what i mean but there were concurrent lesser known players who were also foundational to the scene. In the early to mid 2010s, there was a swath of genre-bending DIY, online-based artists, collectives, labels, and radio shows distributed via SoundCloud, Bandcamp, or otherwise that made up an early hyperpop adjacent community. Long before that term became synonymous with a Spotify playlist and majorly recognized by the public. 
I've seen like go through various different like transformations where lots of things like come and go online, that kind of thing. There wasn't really like a name for the weird SoundCloud. It was just like SoundCloud music. Hyperpop to me, it has the like DIY internet music aesthetic. Um, and I think that's where it started. I was just kind of looking for stuff to uh, put my music on to like throw it out there. Ran across Bandcamp. I was like, all right, well, this is free and I don't have money. So let's throw some music up there, you know? Around 2012, 2013 is when I released Desire. Um, and I think that was an era where um, a lot of different artists were exploring what the internet is or, or what the internet is like for both music communities and also like for, for distribution. What primarily got me interested into, I guess, modern Japanese electronic music is labels like uh, Tracky Tracks and like Maltane. Like everybody was just putting records up for free on the internet. And I think that was like kind of peak SoundCloud era. But for me, it was like peak net internet music era, at least the first wave. PC music and hyperpop is a SoundCloud genre. The whole process of basically completely decommercializing music and just putting up random remixes with these crazy sounds is what proliferated that genre to being as successful as it is. It's like the wild west of the music, like internet. This music community coalesced around a variety of dance and pop music aesthetics, many of which were viewed as tacky by the mainstream. And while the associated sounds and genres came from all over the place, as is usually the case when discussing hyperpop, this community was threaded by a few major elements. As a reaction to mainstream club culture, the demographic was largely, and very importantly, LGBTQ+ and the aesthetics often leaned into the weird and experimental, combining bright and bubbly textures with fast, irregular tempos and strange sound design. It was fun. It was warm and welcoming. It was hyperactive. I think it does clue into how much of a foundation the queer community has in this music scene. My old stuff's like R&B. That shift is is so like one-to-one -one correlated with me coming out and like with me getting more comfortable with my femininity. Most important aspect at that time was seeing other queer people on the internet kind of having this like main, almost mainstream success, like media success. It was hella cool. It's attracted one so many various listeners of, across the LGBTQ spectrum and also has a lot of major artists that are in that community, big and small. This is like actually like being made by people that are outside of the norm. They are the people that are making that inclusiveness like happen. More people can be themselves and it's putting a lot of like marginalized communities on the map. Like a lot for LGBTQ and it's really the biggest genre pushing those identities that I've ever seen. That may be one of the biggest underlying themes. I think what's so important about these genres and like electronic music in the modern day where people can pirate software on the computer that they already have and they can just start making stuff. They can start expressing themselves in a way that maybe doesn't feel like 100% safe in the real world. To be able to do that online is so amazing. And you meet people, you meet their true selves online first. While some may consider influential artists like M.I.A. or Crystal Castles to be hyperpop progenitors, when talking about the musical movement and ethos of hyperpop, we can directly point to this DIY underground internet music community that truly started taking shape around 2012. It was an inclusive, accessible online space where people often interacted and were able to share and make amazing music with one another. It's impossible to mention everyone involved, but I'm going to try my best to discuss some important players that absolutely deserve some spotlight, as well as give them the chance to speak for themselves about the community that has meant so much to them. Platform also informs 
how we make music and how we share music and how we build communities, you know, like music communities. It was just this huge sense of community and I wanted to be a part of that. And um, I, I feel like I am for real. There's always a, a community on the internet that will find you if you just continually post stuff. It's cool with like how the internet works where you, you can make something so esoteric and so odd and there's still people out there who are like, this is sick. To me, that's like almost the first step in making hyperpop is that you've got to be on the internet because it's literally so intrinsic to its existence. We we were not in it to make a monetary gain. We were in there for the community to put our art out there to get feedback. We were there to party and have fun. The internet aspect of all of this is so beautiful and inherent to what's really important about that scene but what's really important about like the internet and its role in music in general give everybody a voice and have them even like you know extend it and show it to people and be able to like boost these platforms and you know hopefully find like an exit from these situations for a lot of people and so for the question everyone has been waiting for what is hyperpop the oldest use of the word that i could find was a 1988 article on the cocktail twins which described the band as hyperpop, defining the term as moody, deeply personal, and or politically conscious music that purposely defies conventional ideas of what's commercial. Fast forward and you can find a 2012 dummy article describing fellow 4AD alum Grimes as hyperpop. What's relatively clear is that while the word was being floated around throughout the early 2010s as a vague descriptor, it was only around 2015 that artists really began using the word to frame their music, as seen through the founding of the Hyperpop Collective in 2016 and in artists like Holiday Howe, who started calling her style of music Hyperpop in 2015 while under her Bubbles alias. Well, I like call the music Hyperpop, this is what I've branded it as. And it sort of mixes like video game music, some like classic pop tunes from the 90s. She also started tagging some of her songs on SoundCloud as hyperpop. So I started making music, but I didn't feel like I could call myself PC Music because I wasn't signed to the label. I was explaining to like my parents, my friends, what is it that I make? There were these dolls uh, called Diva Stars, and they'd all always go like, hyper real, that's hyper cool, like hyper fun. And I thought it's pop music on steroids, it's hyper pop. Because I knew that PC Music was a label term, and it wasn't necessarily going to be what you call the genre. At the time, we named it Hyperpop. We didn't think it was like really a genre. We were like, yeah, this isn't a genre, so we're going to name it this. And then like the more we were doing it, I think a lot more people started calling things Hyperpop. I'm definitely not saying we're the progenitors of the term because that's not the case. I just think we were using this term in a kind of amorphous way. Our collective is Hyperpop and we make hyper pop music, but we don't really know what that means. <laughs> Recently, people were calling that sound like PC music, which is another label. Like, that's stupid too. Like, at least hyper pop kind of sounds like a genre, right? Like yeah. pop and hyper, you can mash that together. It's fantastic. So again, what is hyper pop? What does it mean? That question is, obviously, a major point of contention. John Palmer's recent essay on hyperpop and his description of the term as a scissor label deeply resonated with me, as I'm sure it would with many. He writes, A scissor label is a word or phrase that, for the first time, establishes a widely embraced name for a trend without simultaneously establishing a canonical definition. It is a vague term masquerading as a specific one, where the missing definition is still up for grabs. Sounds about right. What is hyperpop? Is it a genre? You know, or, or is it a sort of like movement? Is it sort of like a, a spirit, you know, a youth culture unfolding? It's almost like you're, you're trying to hold this like music, you know, this, this, this my hands, this, this hyperpop. You're trying to hold it, but it's like it's it's all sort of just like 
dripping down. I think there are people out there who, who think it was made up by Spotify in order to get more people to like listen to a place and just shove a bunch of artists in a certain box. I think there's people who do now see it as a sound and like a legitimate genre that can be replicated. I think it's just the accumulation of a lot of intersecting musical events in a very specific sphere that's ended up in this way. Hyperpop to me feels like kind of a, a culmination or a kind of a nexus point of a lot of like ley lines that have been happening in music for a while. I guess you could say that, that somewhere in the last two or three years is when it like started, but it's it, there's so many things that make it what it is. It's hard to say like when it started, like I always go back to the Spotify playlist because that was the right. moment that like everyone finally started to call themselves that. But before that, it really started when like SoundCloud communities started forming. Nightcore went into more PC music and then eventually turned into Hyperpop. I had not heard that term until probably 2016. I always heard like bubblegum bass and like deconstructed club for like that type right. of shit for like the for right. the sophie like it was like post sophie you know what i right. mean I, it's all the same now it's all like but that's how i remember it i don't look at it like like vaporwave is hyper pop or escape room like it, that doesn't even make sense to me there's just no way that hunter gex is the same genre to me as like hannah diamond even having rigorous definitions and things that identify a genre are as antiquated as having rigorous standards for like something like gender it's unnecessary it's limiting what's exciting about this genre and what is exciting about electronic music now in general is that there are no limitations yeah there's things that like range from like cloud rap to pc music and hyperpop is so vast now it's yeah. not really like one set genre at the end of the day hyperpop isn't a genre as much as it's like a movement of electronic music in a certain direction kind of like it's not like there's any one genre that like makes up hyper pop. It's a lot more than, you know, like a Spotify playlist. I can't really just boil it down into like, here's 40 songs and they're all hyper pop. Mm. The term itself used to be way more conceptual maybe than it is now. Five, six, seven years ago, like there was people that are making hyper pop and a lot of people just like self-identified as hyper pop because it was like an easy thing to say where it was like, ah, we're, we're like, we're on this thing together. We're like hyper pop artists. But you couldn't have like a, a YouTube video of like how to make a hyper pop song and like five minutes back then because the sounds were so vastly different like we were so close and we were like in this like weird twitter family and everything and like going to the same shows but we didn't really like sound the same hyper pop is more about the community and the fan connection more so than the actual style there are artists that have totally different styles that could fit under the umbrella because They've been part of the scene. Hyperpop celebrates individualism with unity, this tight-knit community that everyone shares and is a part of. Hyperpop is not real. Shut the fuck up. It's not like a genre. It's just like the movement. So I'm, I'm really saying it is not a genre. Shut the yeah. fuck up. Someone said to me that Hyperpop isn't even about what it sounds like. It's about the vibe, which doesn't make sense to me, but I also see where they're coming from. You could listen to the most mainstream of like mainstream EDM. In the same conversation, you could start talking about like Ortega or something. And like people would just be like, oh yeah, that's cool. And I just found that lack of any kind of gatekeeping or elitism really cool. At that time, I was a bit more like cynical about what pop music had to offer and stuff. I was coming out of my like edgy teenage phase of like, oh, pop music sucks. Only listen to like good music or some shit. And it really helped me open up to it. So I think it just ended up really helping me grow as not even just like a musician but like kind of as a person as well. Okay, but what if you had to pin down what it sounded like? I just expect it to be like super fast, you know, in your face, just, you know, kind of deal. And just like taking drum loop and then putting like flutes and then putting like crazy shit. It's maximalism. That's what it is. Like, it's like, how do I make the sound a little worse than it, than it used to? You know, Nightcore being a big influence as, as polarizing of a topic that mm -hmm. is, you know, people were speeding up their songs, they were pitching up their vocals and making stuff that I think was like really fresh and new sounding. You're using these outside left of field genres, but then pushing that to an extreme level and making it into a pop song.
kind of just a mutated form of pop music or high energy pop beat with high synth, very sugary, almost bubblegum pop. Like modern bubblegum pop is like what I consider hyper pop to be. At its core, it is a pop genre. Like it is about catchiness and like pop structure and everything like that. Like people my age or a bit younger who grew up making music on the computer, like using like more modern programs where they kind of use the software as an instrument and then grew up with like Swedish style songwriting. Like I, I feel like that's kind of the main current is like yeah. modern music software and like growing up with Britney and Backstreet Boys. I would describe hyper pop as a maximalist take on pop music. A lot of elements of distortion and deconstruction and pulling from different genres. Pitch shifting vocals are a huge element to it. I feel like it's representative of the time that we live in for sure just constant barrage of different sounds and images and sensations and things like that and i feel like this music kind of conjures all of that it's almost overwhelming to listen to I get, it's kind of almost like a cliche of like you know just a happy accident that moment where like the computer crashed and it just played only the vocal, but it kind of like glitched out a bit. And then I'm like, oh, that's that's really fucking amazing. I should cut everything and just go to vocal there. Like, thank you, computer. It's super maximalist in that it's like, oh my God, this massive clang, but, but there's only one clang and it's hitting you right now. So I think it's kind of this like singular focused maximalism that is what hyperpop feels like. Like sound design was important back then and it is now too. It's like a new way of thinking about musical instruments. I think my music is funny. It's not trying to be cool. Hyperpop isn't it funny? It's weird. Hyperpop is one of those things where like when you're listening to it, it's 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 like on the verge of being something horrible and annoying, but like the person gives it just enough flair that it's like awesome. How far can you push the electronic pop to the edge of like being almost annoying? But somehow on that very edge where it's meeting with just like noise, it, it's interesting. It becomes like very powerful. I think a lot of people are looking for something they haven't heard before. So they're going to find it there on the edge of where two separate genres meet or two separate creations meet. So what exactly are these sonic aesthetics that have so heavily influenced hyperpop and internet-based artists? I think it makes sense to start with some internet-based visual and sonic musical movements. Vaporwave, a style of music that takes previously recorded songs and slows them down, is a sort of spiritual predecessor to hyperpop in its sonic and visual approach, its online community framework, and in its postmodern, self-aware sensibility. I think Vaporwave plays a really big role in being like one of the first globalized genres totally online, yeah. taking these these old sounds that people felt nostalgic for. There were really no rules to Vaporwave, and I and I think that extends to Digicore and Hyperpop. You just kind of have to be there. You kind of have to be doing the stuff with the community. I've had a lot of different feelings about Vaporwave over the years. It is my favorite genre. A lot of the new Vaporwave has completely missed the point. Don't take it so goddamn seriously. The genre is considered, generally considered to be a big joke. It is, and it sounds good. It also sounds good. It has to sound good. It's the Venn diagram of serious and funny. I think they're basically the same, except for Vaporwave is like more for geeks and nerds. Hyperpop is more for like dorks <laughs> and partiers, you know what I mean? There is also, of course, Nightcore, which took previously recorded songs and sped them up, which resulted in hyperactive drum patterns and pitched up vocals that remain heavily present in hyperpop to this day. Keep in mind also at the same time that this is happening, Nightcore is a big thing. 
and Nightcore is massively influencing Hyperpop. In some time in like the 2000s, these two Norwegian schoolboys, and they basically just spit up a couple of tracks and it became like a huge YouTube sensation. All that anime fucking pictures, Hatsune Miku on top like Nightcore, My Chemical Romance type shit. Me and a bunch of my friends at the time who were fans of this stuff, started making our own Nightcore accounts. I was very inspired by Nightcore and I was very adamant and like determined that there should be a genre that came out of Nightcore because Nightcore was like technically just songs that were sped up. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, what if there was original music that had the same energy and the pitched up vocals? There's no mandate of Nightcore, right? That's the idea. Like Nightcore is like super open, right? It's just so easy to make. You just have to have a good ear and just like have some time, like 30 minutes. Nightcore is like actually super anarchic to me in that like kind of anybody can be involved in it and anybody can make an account. It's been super helpful, I think, for a lot of like marginalized and misrepresented and like queer and, and BIPOC folk because it's so legitimately like grassroots. There's not any sort of capitalistic intent in Nightcore. Who's making money doing Nightcore? No one's making money doing Nightcore. That ethos is what I loved about Hyperpop, the initial wave and kind of it's we're going to put these records out for free. We're just gonna play shows for our friends and like we're just gonna get a lot of friends, I guess. There is also Chiptune and its successor Digital Fusion, which have basis in video game music influences and internet-based communities. It's really easy to like short sell video game music, especially, you know, back in the 90s, 80s, like early 2000s, because it's like, oh, there's like real music, there's movie scores, and then there's like, you know, the Kirby theme song, or there's like these Pokemon town themes. And then you get a little bit older and you learn more about some of those composers that were making those themes, and you're like, well, this music's like actually really complicated. It's like, I think an entire generation of people were exposed to very complex classical and jazz ideas through the scope of like chiptune and like Game Boy sounds and stuff like that. My huge influence early on it, with music was from games. And once I realized that that game music was really complicated and that there was a way to create it that didn't like lessen its merit as music, just because it was like with these square waves and sine waves and stuff. I really got into that and like found like a huge community of like people that were making music that just was that, just making chip tune. My influences, jazz, a drum and bass, video game music, definitely video game music. I spent probably just as much time playing video games growing up as just like listening to the sound test in the actual games, you know? <laughs> kind of a new genre called digital fusion. I'd fall under that for sure. Chiptune has a German genre called digital fusion, similar style to funk music and like fusion or jazz. Got involved in electronic music because I wanted to be a video game music composer. I was kind of a big player in the chiptune community around maybe like 2011, 2012. That's where I like built my first sense of like online community. The chiptune sound can be kind of blown out. It can be hyper synthetic. I mean, like there's not a single acoustic sound in much of chiptune. That collective and that movement of digital fusion, that is what I'm moving forward with now. And it's a term made by artists for artists. While I'm like hyper pop adjacent, I'm really more of like a jazz artist. Of course, hyperpop artists are also influenced by various strains of pop music. Y2K artists from the late 90s and early 2000s, both in their sonic and visual aesthetics, play a large role in hyperpop culture, as seen in huge breakout artists like Charlie XCX, Rina Sawayama, Slater, and Dorian Electra. Baby, can't you see? I'm calling. I got like you. But also in smaller, formative artists such as Aisha Erotica, Liz, Donna Tachi, and That Kid. Hip hop is huge for many of the newer artists in the scene, as we will discuss later, but you can see early mixtures of experimental dance music with rap in artists like Leaf in Cakes Tequila. And of course, J-pop and kawaii cute aesthetics have been a huge reference point that many artists still draw from. Oh, 
I think J-pop is a is a big influence. I think J-pop is a, is a huge influence, and not a lot of people talk about that nowadays. When you think about hyperpop now, you think about Gex, Pots and Pans, Sophie Snare, right? But I think a lot of that started being influenced by Japanese producers. PC Music, Porter Robinson, all this stuff. What you'll find is they all reference basically late 90s, 2000s J-pop. I would be really fucking surprised if you saw anybody who makes hyperpop who didn't know what Perfume or Capsule was or Yes, Tuck in the Kato was. Dance music has played a huge role in the development of hyperpop, with artists taking from an assortment of different styles. Hyperpop artists take a lot from rave genres like happy hardcore, hardstyle, and donk, for example. Put a donk on it. <laughs> as they do other jittery, rhythmically complex club genres like Jersey Club and Footwork. Eurodance, which connects to the Y2K aesthetic, is also a big one. And then you have other EDM genres like trance, trap, dubstep, and future bass. The former of which inspired artists to make Skrillex-esque maximalist sound design, and the latter of which was inspired by artists like Rusty and then transmuted into Porter Robinson and Flume type stuff, which ultimately influenced a lot of SoundCloud artists to make fun, chopped up electronic bangers. But hyperpop is more than just sonic aesthetics. It's a massive musical community. So tune in for the next part to see which artists, labels, and collectives were utilizing and combining these genres into a new internet sound and online subcultural movement.